we will begin with Steve Portugal, who's the retired professor of ceramics and 3D design from Cerritos College. And I just wanna share that Stephen, uh, over a decade ago, really started facing these questions in a very um, direct way. And, and I think it's positioned in the spectrum of, of the group today with, um, with a viewpoint that he'll be sharing in a moment that um, you know, really is facing the hard struggle of how to create work that inevitably has a carbon footprint. And so I invite you, Steve, to begin. And thank you all again for being with us. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks to Emily and uh, Joan at the Craft in America. Study Center, and uh, <clears throat> yes, as Emily just mentioned, uh, she and I have been having this conversation for quite some time now. Um, in 2011, I was invited to participate in the, uh, the 70th annual, 70th script ceramic annual, and we were asked to write a statement uh, about our current work, and I thought this was an opportunity to share my concerns, and I wrote a statement rather than calling it the elephant in the room, which is, you know, what the whole, you know, the carbon issue in ceramics felt like to me. I mean, I, 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 it appears that maybe I was wrong and others have been giving this some deep thought also. Um, <clears throat> so I entitled it the ceramic elephant in the classroom. But uh, before we, before we uh, get too far ahead of ourselves, so let me, uh, Let's go back about uh, 50 years. In 1970, I enrolled in um, at Cal State Northridge out of high school. And this was a very, uh, you know, it was a heady time. The Vietnam War was, was roiling, um, but so was the counterculture. And uh, <clears throat> as part of that counterculture, we, we were all embracing this notion of, let's get back to the earth, back to mother nature. And, and we, um, ceramics was part of that. And we thought, oh, great, you know, what could be more natural than working with, you know, with the earth? Um, in those subsequent 50 years, as we've all, we are all witnessing now, uh, it isn't that simple. And we, we now know that the ceramic process is, is quite carbon intensive, as Emily just mentioned. And, you know, at all stages of it, you know, it's not just the firing process, it is, it is the mining and transportation of the materials, which we, we're using materials from all over the world, and, and then the production and the firing process. There were three, oh, I forgot to start my timer, sorry. Uh, there were three uh, really important events in, in my memory that uh, got me thinking really hard about this issue. Uh, one of the first was uh, Al Gore's documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, in 2006. And, you know, it, it was clear then and is abundantly clear now that, uh, you know, we, we need to act. Uh, and then six years later, I was in Colorado uh, for my niece's wedding. And on the drive, she, the wedding was in Steamboat Springs. And on the drive up, you know, what I saw was uh, instead of, the mountains being green with trees was the mountains were brown and black as a result of the, you know, the warming climate and the proliferate, proliferation of the, the bark beetle, which was destroying the trees, making them susceptible to fire and then the subsequent fires. Uh, and then uh, and the last event that I remember was, you know, paying attention to the news and I heard this uh, scientist, journalist, I don't remember his or her name, you know, talking about, uh, you know, what we as individuals can do. And uh, her, his or her conclusion was uh, that uh, they were going to stop flying, that, uh, you know, the, the carbon released in jet fuel was just too damaging to the environment. And I, it got me thinking, Geez, you know, I mean, that's a serious sacrifice, you know. So um, I started thinking more and more about, you know, what, you know, what could I do? And I, I thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to find a way 
to uh, to continue this work uh, in, in a way that is less damaging and less carbon intensive. So I began changing my approach. And in a moment, I'm going to show you some uh, brief PowerPoint presentation uh, and describe what I, what I was doing. But at the conclusion of this, you know, year or two of experimenting with more efficient ways of firing, I just decided I'm just going to give it up. Uh, I'm going to stop. You know, I, I, I had been working with clay for close to 50 years. I had consumed probably way more than my share of carbon. And when you, you know, you include all of the students work that I had been firing over the years, it, it, it seemed like a lot to me. So. Uh, I just you know, stopped doing it in my own studio. I, now, I didn't have the freedom to do that at school. You know, I couldn't just have the school quit cold turkey. So I, you know, found ways uh, that we could clean up the uh, clean up the process. You know, I insisted that we only fire kilns when they're full. Uh, you can work smaller. You know, we we did whatever we could to keep the solid waste out of the water systems. Um, and then, you know, during my, the end of my tenure at the college, we started designing a new facility and I was able to put in, you know, implement some things there, a much, a much more efficient uh, trap system in the plumbing to catch the solids. And, um, you know, I brought in, the school had never really had electric kilns. Uh, so, you know, we brought in some electric kilns. There are still gas kilns there, but, um, you know, I think the future is a lot of it is going to be in electric firing if we can source uh, source the, that electricity from renewable resources. So, um, and then uh, before you know, at home, you know, there were several things that I was able to do in addition to changing my work, and that is, I uh, we were able to join this thing called the Clean Power Alliance. I don't know that this is available to everybody, but it means here in Culver City, we could elect to have all of our electricity uh, come from renewable resources. And you know, so we, you know, we're, I wanted to do everything we could uh, as an individual. You know, we bought a used electric car. Uh, I ride my bike a lot. You know, we do all those things. You know, gave up red meat years and years ago. We compost and you know, in the garden and do all those things. Um, for those of you who, who have some money in the stock market, uh, you can divest. That would be a good thing to divest from any, you know, anything having to do with fossil fuels. Okay, so let us, uh, uh, Emily has the, uh, we're ready to go, I think. Um, I wanted to share my concerns with my students, so I prepared a uh, uh, a PowerPoint presentation on the firing process, and, and it led to um, uh, a discussion about a very basic primary, which you'll see, and I'm sure my the other panelists will, will also discuss this. So we could see the next slide, please. All right, and this is the you know, basic equation for the combustion of methane gas, which is what we're using in gas kilns. And the outcome of that, as you'll see beyond the arrow there, is carbon dioxide. Uh, water and heat. And <clears throat> next slide, please. Which led to a, you know this discussion of ceramics and climate change. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, you know the, a very basic illustration of the greenhouse effect. You know the, we release carbon into the atmosphere, and it that car those carbon particles trap heat, and the earth heats up as if it were in a greenhouse. Next slide, please. Uh, you've all seen these images. I just found this more current one of the, the melting of the polar ice cap. I mean, it, you know, it, it is abundantly clear by now that uh, you know the, the, <clears throat> the earth is warming and it is caused by man-made activities. Next slide, please. All right. So here's a you know brief discu discussion of uh, you know what fossil fuels are and where they come from, and I'm, I'm sure everybody's aware there's a terrible irony in this, and that all life forms are carbon-based, and but the, the fuels that we're burning are derived from the decomposition of these, these living forms. These, <clears throat> next slide, please. 
this is a pie chart showing um, <clears throat> where our, you know, what our greenhouse gas emissions are. I don't know, I, I, this is probably fairly true across the planet, but most of it is carbon dioxide and some of it is methane. Next slide. Uh, this one, I am hoping the other panelists will can enlighten us about this. I, you know, there is no nothing that I could find that says ceramics is this, you know, is this one percent of the pie chart? I don't know what it is, but I, certainly it's part of it is transportation, some of it's electricity, uh, much of it is in industry, and some of it's in commerce and residential. But I, I would love to know if anybody's figured out what percentage of the problem it is derived from ceramics. Next slide, please. And there, you know, these are the things we'll probably be uh, uh, on our uh, agenda today to talk about. And there's a, a list of things that you can do, um, you know, simple things that we can all do to to make this a cleaner, cleaner uh, process. Next slide. And then here's some uh, uh, places you can go. Uh, maybe not coincidentally, but just this week the IPCC released its sixth report on climate change. That's a, it's a 3,000 page document, so I don't think you'll want to read it, but uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of good information there and some other organizations. And then uh, Emily introduced me to another group that looks very, very uh, good, the Climate Center. So if we could add that to the, to the website. Next slide, please. And uh, this is, uh, this piece, Natur Mort, uh, is was a piece that was done at the end of my um, life as an artist working in clay. It's made in three parts, uh, uh, modularly fired, one, once fired in a small electric kiln, and, and then coated with a non-ceramic finish. And I, st I, started, uh, I started expanding my horizons, working with found materials, as you see on the piece on the right here, it's behind me here somewhere. And um, next slide, please. Um, I, here in Culver City, there are oil fields very close to us. And I found this sign up there in the oil fields attached to the fence. And I said, I got to take this home. So I dismounted it. And it once said danger, now it says anger. Next slide, I put it on this tea tray, the silver tree, tea tray. And the final slide. Um, this is a piece of, made from reclaimed wood that I made in 2010, entitled The Hour is Getting Late. And I think um, that's an appropriate way for me to end my portion of this. Uh, it's time for us to act. And uh, that's what the IPCC said. So thank you all. And I look forward to the rest of this. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, going to move to Julia Galloway, who's joining us from Montana. She's professor uh, at the University of Montana Missoula and also member of NSICA's Green Task Force. Thank you, Julia. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm so happy to be here today. I'm coming to you from the Red Lodge Clay Center in Montana. And I'm going to share with you um, two different projects I'm working on that uh, are, are involved with uh, green activities. So, um, so I'm so glad everybody could make it today. This is such a important, important subject near and dear to all of our hearts, I'm sure. Uh, Emily, thank you so much for getting this together. Okay, here we go. So I wanted to talk with you guys about two different projects that I'm working on. And um, one is called the Field Guide for Ceramic Artisans. And it is a uh, resource website for people when they're first leaving school, especially to help them continue to make work. And then also for people who work in isolation uh, or also just looking for anything. And uh, about a year ago, I put up um, a chapter called Environmental Impacts. And on this chapter, there's just different information about how to deal with raw materials, firing processes, waste, um, water, and shipping. And you guys, this website is just something that I run. I just do it uh, on my own with actually quite a bit of help from friends. And um, I'm always looking for more information for the website. So, but we just put this, oh, here we go. There we go. So we just put up this chapter and it's getting a lot of traffic because my sense is in the field is that everyone wants to do something, but they just don't know what to do, honestly. We all wanna do better. We all wanna do the right thing, but there's so much kind of unclear information out there. And we all say low fire is better, high fire is better, gas is better, you know, all those kinds of 
things that we're sort of wrestling with. So I tried to gather some of that information um, that I could get my hands on in the field guide <clears throat> so that people had information so that they could make decisions themselves for what the best way to fire for them was, the best way to get their clay, what kind of clay they wanted to use, where the clay was going, how to save water. Water is a huge thing in our field, of course. What to do with your waste, um, glaze waste, clay waste. Um, you know, I think we're all sort of casting about trying to figure out what we can do that's a little better. Of course, we all know that um, you know, ceramics is taking raw materials out of the ground and it's mining and, um, you know, we fire, we use electricity and gas. We all know these things are problematic, but I think that there's definitely things that we can do that is a little better. So that's really what the field guide, um, the information that I'm collecting here. So it's just a collection of information and we're always looking for more. The main thing I wanted to talk about today was the Inseca Green Task Force. Uh, the Inseca Green Task Force started in 2008 under the presidency of Robert Harrison when he was president of Inseca, and they formed the task force to focus, really start to focus on um, green issues in the field. And the very early meetings were just trying to figure out even what this meant. And the task force was formed and it's been meeting consistently since um, like every month, the third Friday of every month since 2008. And it has about um, usually between 11 and 14 members. And here I'll read it officially, Inseca's Green Task Force is committed to environmental stewardship in all venues from administrative work to conference gatherings and to extending educate Inseca's members about important environmental issues affecting the ceramic arts. So there's a few things that are big news or new news for the task force. And one is that Inseca is now supporting a um, sustainability fellowship where somebody will be around it, uh, awarded $2,000 to do research uh, in green practices. So um, that's just getting voted on. I think yesterday the board voted on it. So that's a, a very exciting new thing about ways of researching. I think one thing that's a little bit tricky in ceramics is that we all talk to each other and it's hard for us to find um, information that we need that is sort of outside of our experiences. Uh, for example, I learned how to fire like my teacher learned how to fire, like his teacher learned how to fire. So we're all firing like it's 1968 or 1973 sort of. So I'm hoping that this kind of um, fellowship, whether it be about materials or research or firing processes, can bring us more information and can help us connect with professionals in the field that can get us real information. So the Green Task Force is involved with many different kinds of activities. And we do blog posts about different green practices that people are doing involving wild clay, um, uh, waste, studio waste, um, how to deal with local clay, um, making pavers out of clay and glaze waste, uh, responsible studio practices, including um, careful use of water and packing and shipping. And the two sort of, um, Folks very uh, involved with the Green Task Force are Wendy Gers, who you're gonna hear from shortly. And then also Robert Harrison, who was really in charge of starting this. And he wrote sort of the existing book on sustainable ceramics. And this is him here with his work. And the book is a very, very helpful uh, information about how to um, uh, engage in green practices. And it's really been the backbone of the Green Task Force for a long time. Um, just recently, uh, last month, we did a program called Dig It, and it was about different, uh, how different people are using clay practices. And so um, we had uh, people from all, it was a huge turnout, a crazy big turnout, global, like this huge global. People were getting up in the middle of the night in, in Australia, and, you know, thanks to Wendy, making such strong um, uh, global uh, networking. Um, and it was it was super exciting. These gals, folks, did a presentation here. 
So Josh DeWeese did a presentation. He started a program called um, Wild Clay at um, Montana State University. And him and his students go out and dig wild clay and they dig clay where uh, roads have been cut. They're not going on to indigenous lands or private lands to use clay. They just go where the roads have been cut. And legally you can harvest the 10 by 10 square and so he goes in with his students and finds these um, raw materials primarily for making glazes. So he talked about sort of a shift from purchasing glaze materials to finding your own glaze materials and the different sort of tastes and aesthetics that come out of that. We had a fabulous presentation from one of my students, Nicole Ham, and she researched different materials and about where they're mined, where they're processed, and then when before we buy them. So she had done a long study into minspar about that minstar was dug up in the Carolinas and then it was goes all the way across the ocean to get processed and then is sent all the way back to California and then we buy it in Helena um, because I live in Montana. So it was just amazing to me how far all these materials have been traveling and that's really um, started to influence us at the school about what materials we use and, high, and, um, and where we buy them from. So we're as concerned about the um, traveling, the footprint of the traveling of the materials as much as the mining of the materials themselves. And we also had a fabulous presentation by Yulia, and she has a really quite uh, interesting studio practices in using raw materials and local materials to be creating her own work and her sort of holistic life. And um, <clears throat> this presentation will be available on the Inseca website shortly. So that's, those are the two things that I really wanted to inform you guys about, about sort of what we're, uh, what we're working on, and um, hope you can follow us through the NSICA website. Um, the last thing I was thinking is that I do practice what I preach, and I'm currently working on two projects. One, I'm working on an endangered species project, where I'm making urns for all the endangered species of um, of uh, uh, the continental United States. And the other is that I'm working on this project in Montana where we're figuring out how many trees could be planted that will offset the carbon footprint of the wood kilns in Montana and where we need to have more shade in the state. So that's a super interesting project I'm working on with our state um, um, arborist. So uh, that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. And I so appreciate you um, coming in and I look forward to discussion and the questions in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, I also want to mention that we, uh, we're sharing links in the chat, but uh, long term on the page where our eco guide will be living, we will also have links to various resources, including um, the Enseca Green Task Force, Robert Harrison's book, um, and, and so on. And we invite you all to continue sharing um, sharing that information with us because we will grow that page over time um, and expand the resources that we list there. So thank you for mentioning that along with so many other um, important topics that we'll continue to discuss as the program goes on. So next, um, an additional member of the NCCA Green Task Force, Wendy Gers is joining us from London today curator, scholar, and founder, creator of Clean Green Ceramics, a very new nonprofit that she will be telling us about today and how certification works and the need that generated and inspired her to form this organization. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you so much, Emily. It's wonderful to be here and congratulations to you and your team for setting up um, such an exciting and timeless uh, project. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Thank you so much. I'm a scholar and a curator and recently founded Clean Green Ceramics, uh, as Emily mentioned, a certification body for ceramics. Why did I start it? Well, I'm a mum. I have two teenage boys and every year I sort of watch the news and it just gets worse and worse and um, like everybody feel I needed to step up and be part of the rather than being part of the problem to be part of the solution and that really came about the beginning of the year when I read these headlines on the 8th of January that 2020 was the joint hottest year on record and as we all know whether we're living in Europe or America, Australia, Indonesia um, that 
2021 is going to be far, you know, far hotter than um, 2020. And in fact, you know, we've we've seen a summer of unprecedented flooding and fires across the globe, which will certainly, um, you know, hopefully mark people's consciousness. Um, sorry, I, I wanted to. And um, on in uh, Steve's presentation, he mentioned um, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And in fact, it was on the 9th of August that this panel, um, which released this huge document, claimed that global heating is accelerating at a far faster rate than scientists have previously predicted. And um, my question is, and it's a rhetorical question, uh, is that is it morally responsible to continue making ceramics or is this just a harmful indulgence? Uh, the world probably has more than enough ceramics. Um, I personally know of many local charities that put all donated ceramics into skips where they're crushed and used for road fill. Um, commercial ceramic factories are far more efficient um, in terms of the use of raw material and resources, far more efficient than an artist could ever be. And, and so I sort of ask myself, what are our options? Um, should we simply hang up our, our, our aprons and kiln gloves? Perhaps should we be reworking existing ceramic practices, reconfiguring kintsugi mosaic techniques, uh, reusing, reworking, reconfiguring? To be perfectly honest about it, most of our pots will probably and our ceramic sculptures will probably end in landfill within a decade, either broken or discarded. Is an option not to fire at all, and certainly this is a growing trend among emerging artists, um, but it isn't just about firing. It's also the energy and the resources used in providing the raw materials, um, in shipping, and in the equipment. So what do you think? How do you justify your pottery activities? How will you describe it to your grandchildren where in, when you're in a nursing home and they are trying to cope with a more troubled world? And those thoughts keep me up at night. And, and that's the reason why I set up Clean Green Ceramics. Um, and I love this quote by Donna Haraway, which says, Learning to stay with the trouble of living and dying together on a damaged earth will prove more conductive to the kind of thinking that would provide the means to building more livable futures. And we do need to pause and look at the situation with absolute honesty and with courage um, and, and not shy from the elephant in the, the room, which, which is far bigger than an elephant, unfortunately, and far, far more scary than an elephant, and one that really requires courage and, and more than anything, creativity. So thinking about environmental practices, uh, the, when I was a young student, we spoke about the three R's, reuse, recycle, and reduce. We're now move to the 12 R's and I won't go through all of them, but, but there they are. Um, and they're very inspiring and, and certainly ones I imagine that we all use in our and apply in our everyday lives and certainly in, in our practices as well. Moving on to environmental management specifically for studio potters and for ceramic artists, um, I created this a uh, pyramid, sorry, um, that really looks at the different levels of energy consumption within studios and the biggest proportion is obviously raw materials, atmosphere and energy. Um, the next level is your actual studio practice, the making and firing and lastly shipping. So who is green, Clean Green Ceramics? It's um, a small not-for-profit that I set up earlier this year and um, we offer certification 
for sustainable practices and act as an education, accreditation and support body that assesses environmental management for ceramic artists and places where ceramics are made. So we want to create a community of people that are passionate about the environment as they are about ceramics and want to find a greener and more sustainable future for this art. Um, and that's includes st studio potters, uh, residencies, education facilities, and eventually potteries. So what, is, what do we do um, for our certification? Well, you can go onto my website and the four very simple steps are to register. And once you sign up for our mailing list, you will immediately have access to a phenomenal resources page that has um, links to Julia's, lots of links to Julia's website, as well as many other resources that are very useful. Um, if you want to be um, assessed, con you know, you'll contact me else. Um, there's a very small fee you will, and, and let's look at it. So look at, this is the certification process. Oh, sorry, no, it's not. <laughs> um, we'll talk about it more, but you'll submit an application. Um, I would send you a questionnaire and you would complete the questionnaire and I would you would receive feedback and then ultimately a certification which would last for two years. So the certification process, why, why is it important besides the pure, simple, peace of mind and um, the capacity to be able to look at your children, grandchildren and great grandchildren in the eyes and say, I did my best, um, is to one, obviously build your brand, to communicate your values and the impact of your art with pride, to actively make a difference to your own health and your well-being beyond, as well as that of your community. Um, increase engagement by collect, connecting with your clients' values and ultimately together build a better world. Um, so the, the certification obviously offers you access to a lot of resources. You become part of a family. Uh, you receive regular mails and information, um, invitations to webinars and um, you know, a lot of interesting events and organizations that are offering training, additional training, for example. And um, it really assures potential customers of the sustainability of your practice or your educational institution or your residency. So a little bit more about what's involved in the certification. So firstly, there's a questionnaire and that takes quite a while to, to complete probably can the whole process would take a maximum of six weeks or should take a maximum of about six weeks. Although Yulia Makuklik, who's the Ukrainian mentioned in Julia's presentation, who was with us on Dig It, recently did it, completed her certification and questionnaire within about a week. Um, you also are required to develop an environmental policy and an environmental action plan where you take concrete steps to reduce your impact on the environment. Um, and in terms of the environmental policy and the action plan, I do supply templates to help you with that. So what are some of those questions and what does that questionnaire look like? Um, I can't obviously give you all of that within a brief 10 minute presentation, but really we're looking for a commitment to environmental procurement. So your materials and your sourcing um, and looking at on your own terms and within your own practice, finding environmental solutions and innovations for how you run your space. We'd like you to be communicating and engaging with stakeholders, students, clients, um, friends and family on environmental sustainability using your social media and your voice as a platform to champion uh, environmental issues and um, take actions that lead to adopting more sustainable practices within your micro enterprise or within your school residency, et cetera. So what do we do for you well, the, the, we create a community and we empower artists, education facilities, residencies and potteries to improve your practices, products and services. 
And um, really our ultimate aim is to ensure a better tomorrow, one small step at a time. So the certification aims um, furthermore to, to, to champion solidarity on a global scale. And in terms of the costs of the certification, well, there's different tiered costs and tiered prices, and I've just put, and, and they're very affordable. Um, I have high income economies and low income economies. There's a list of those countries and um, certification starts at 150, sorry, US dollars for um, individual artists and potters um, and goes up to 300 US dollars for high income economies. And so, for example, United States and large parts of Western Europe would be considered high income economies. And I've just, you can find out, you know, more specifically about who are high income economies and low income economies based on uh, World Bank and United Nations um, statistics. So there is that list and there's different tariffs for um, residencies and education institutions that's all on the website. As an NGO or NPO, a percentage of our profits are donated to tree planting and, and why? Well, it's obvious it fights climate change and creates a habitat for endangered species. Really, it ticks as many boxes as possible of um, United Nations sustainability efforts. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to be wrapping up and really saying that we're all responsible. Yes, industry makes a bigger mess than we do, but we've got to start with ourselves and we're all responsible. We're all leaders and we're all change makers and that change needs to start today. So thank you very much for having me here, Julia, Julia sorry, Emily and uh, Craft in America. It's a great honor to, to share my work and research into clean green ceramics and uh, environmental certification and environmental management with you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, again, so critical that we have finite concrete solutions coming, coming down the pipeline and exciting to hear what you're establishing and certainly the interest of artists across the world and participating in this is um, encouraging as well and no surprise. So thank you. We'll revisit more um, as a group at the end. So next I'd like to introduce um, Joan Takayama Ogawa, who is an artist here in Pasadena, California and professor of product design and ceramics at Otis College of Art and Design here in Los Angeles. Joan, welcome and there you go. Thank you so much. Well, hello everyone. Um, I will be, uh, I will talk less and show more today, I hope. Um, at any rate, I would like to start by talking a little bit about how I was bitter for uh, that I spent 16 years uh, in higher education for my own personal use. Um, and now it's all coming together. So I first started at UCLA and geography and ecosystems and East Asian studies, which took me to uh, Japan, where I really firsthand saw a country with a very few natural resources then over to Stanford in the education school, moved from Stanford, of course, over to Crossroads School in Santa Monica, California, where I taught social science, as well as became the academic dean of the middle school. And then for a moment of insanity, I decided I would make coffee mugs for every middle school faculty member and enrolled in Ralph Becerra's ceramics class in, uh, at Otis College of Art and Design. And it, of course, changed my life. I should mention that probably genetically, I am predisposed towards ceramics because my family has been involved in ceramics for uh, since the 15th century in Tokunama, Japan. So in 1989, I began my studio practice and my most important point was to be profitable. So I started off with no paper towels, don't wanna pay for it, a substitute with rags and cut towels, 
um, I, I started way, uh, wedging paper waste into clay very early on in 1989 because I noticed that it was a great uh, way to kind of um, uh, spill out and, and actually use less clay. However, then I was burning trees and you know, then I gum up my kiln. So I, this story is about a lot of failure. I started reclaiming clay in buckets and I use only one clay body and that uh, is a low fire earthenware. My plaster coddling clay is stored in reused uh, clay bags. I reuse my and use reuse inside out clay bags in my orchard to protect my fruit from rats. Rats love to eat clay. So what they do is they eat the clay on the bag and then they are deterred and go elsewhere. Uh, they get tired and they don't eat my fruit. Um, plaster bats are made with extra plaster. So when I'm making a plaster mold, I, I have bat, bat uh, making at the ready. Uh, I have no sink in my studio, no running water, and I use a half a tofu container of water at, at any given time. Uh, less water equals less cracking. So again, my profit margin went up because I wasn't losing as many pieces. I went to electric kilns and later on computerized electric kilns uh, to avoid fossil fuels. Uh, I use old uh, bed sheets as canvas boards. So that's what I started in 1989. Um, during COVID, I decided to disconnect the dishwasher and use the racks as, dry, as drying racks. I am no longer buying clothes, which has my family and friends uh, dismayed. And they have become now my personal shopper as I wear their used clothing. I use antique kimono fabric to, to make curtains, homemade puppy toys, et cetera. But in 1991, we had a catastrophic um, earthquake at our home. Fortunately, we had uh, insurance. However, it, and then I went to Hawaii and started seeing the coral looking distressed. So I made this um, dinnerware set, uh, which I called plate tectonics. And uh, here you can put your dipping sauce over here. You can put some sort of uh, uh, food in a uh, vegetable here and probably your fish or whatnot. And then here I serve sushi. I took off the legs of our former dining room table, knowing that we were inheriting a dining room table from my husband's grandmother. And I mounted the former dining room table in the dining room and then hold up my uh, plate tectonics dinnerware. Uh, the following year, we had another cat catastrophe, the Altadena Pasadena fire from 3 to 4 a.m. We lost 100 hom homes as fire roared down uh, in 1993 and destroying immediately. We had no uh, early warning systems in those days. Uh, this, the fire passed our home and nailed uh, the this is the police state, uh, the fire station was destroyed, as well as the swim club in front of it. So I started working in uh, environmental issues, uh, first looking at how coral looks and then starting to see that we are having some problems, moving on to tipping point cups, our reliance on fossil fuels and overfished. I get even more uh, when I start talking about America's crude awakening. Uh, here we have America, fossil fuels. Uh, here I am, I wrote a poem about sustainable practices because I was teaching cradle to cradle over at Otis College of Art and Design. Um, and here is California's role with sushi uh, and our role with environmental, economic, and just about every disaster you can imagine. California has made its contribution, whether it is subprime lending or fossil fuels. And our, and our tendency to overindulge and overconsume. I know that one fly ruins a meal. Well, several flies destroy a meal. So in 2006, we, we removed the lawn of our front yard. My husband is an organic produce broker, retired now. And he decided that he would take out all of the lawn, put in raised beds, have decomposed granite walkways. Here's our front yard. Uh, at the time I was teaching, uh, uh, cradle to cradle to all English students, first year English students, all of us were. Uh, we adopt one book a year at Otis in the um, academic program and Ed Blakely Jr. came uh, and had the television show going called Living with Ed and that inspired me to grow vegetables. It also inspired in 2006 in the front yard. It also in inspired the Pasadena city, uh, the city of Pasadena to cite us for taking out our lawn. 
Uh, I went down to City Hall. I was on design commission, so I, I felt very bold. I could go anywhere in the city. And I said, you take care of this. Someday you'll be sorry. And now Pasadena gives $500 for taking out the lawn. Uh, in 2008, I joined the Otis product design uh, program and also reopened ceramics at Otis because for a moment, Otis lost its mind, closed the ceramics department, and it was my job to bring it back. We were not accredited because I went all electric kilns at the time. I went all computerized kilns at the time, did not, have a, did not in, uh, install a salt or a gas kiln. So we were not accredited uh, as a legitimate ceramic program, but maybe we should think about that. And it caused me to finally do some functional ceramics and also to redo our kitchen, which is bamboo. And of course, this is bamboo tile that I made, bamboo floor, bamboo, bamboo. I know but I was trying my best. Um, in 2009, Laguna Clay and Hillside uh, Cemetery, we had a, a corporate sponsored project to do a cremation urn project. Hillside uh, ran out of space. And as a result, uh, students made cremation urns. Uh, we've also moved into pet urns. Uh, and of course, the cremation process is not as, um, it is not eco-friendly at all, but this was a land issue. And then Laguna uh, sent us Joe Coons, who passed away. Uh, he was our mentor faculty and he passed away during this project. So the, uh, the sad part was that Joe's final resting place was, uh, was in, uh, in this urn designed by one of the students. So in 2009, Valerie Wu, one of my, the ceram uh, ceramic and also product design student who lives in Guam, brought me chunks of bleach coral that she found on the beach. And then I got really, really worried. I carried the bleach coral in my purse, pockets and aprons. At the time, they didn't know what was causing these problems in Guam. And my first show on climate change was at the uh, at AMOCA, American Museum of Ceramic Art. And and here I am suspending this chandelier with aircraft cable with LED puck lights that are battery operated using a remote. Um, these totems are solar powered under normal conditions. However, this is in a former bank vault at AMOCA and so therefore there was no light. So I made them battery operated. However, I did make them figuratively, figurative or abstract figurative forms to I hope be a haunting message of our our culpability. Here is a, a battery operated LED light that you can go, I, I like to use outdoors. My second uh, climate change show was in 2008 at a commercial gallery in San Francisco, uh, Themes and Projects. I'm happy to say that Themes and Projects has uh, survived the pandemic and they do many, many forward thinking projects. Uh, here, then we get solar powered. Um, this is all done by Christmas tree solar uh, LED lights. So when you're not using your Christmas tree lights or your outdoor lights, um, you can also power uh, outdoor uh, lighting. And this is how I would, I'm lighting the front yard. So then Emily, this is my third climate change show, Emily approached me and I said, let's try using these solar panels in the front windows of Craft in America and see if we can get, an, a generate, get enough storage in these um, solar panels to light them at night. And I think we succeeded, Emily. Here is a piece that Emily at, at Craft in America with the Department of Cultural Affairs at um, was able to uh, do something at LAX for us. And I do know we're running short on time, I apologize. So therefore I decided to take out the backyard and because we had to take out a tree and I decided to build a tree. So I created this and we have flash flooding here up uh, where we live. And so therefore I regraded the entire backyard with a, um, a huge, huge drainage ditch. Okay, and a large oversized um, awning here and with and it is built for solar panels when I can figure it out. All the water comes draining into a Costco shed, which uh, I will have tanks in here. I this is a big failure. Also, it's a little too high at six inches too high to use the gravity. So we're going to pipe it all out to the street. And just before it reaches the street, I will have my storage tanks installed that should really get Pasadena really happy with me. 
This is the final product of our backyard. Everything drains into the center island. Um, here, when it, it usually floods here, and it, you all you see really is the ginkgo tree and this old uh, Japanese lantern, and it sounds like a toilet flushing when uh, when we get our flash floods. So here, um, I'm thinking that profit equals climate change reversal. Uh, we, I would recommend that we lower our uh, temperature of our fires, firings, move to computerized electric kilns, adjust our glazes with non-toxic materials, eliminate gas, wood, and salt kilns, sorry, uh, solar panels uh, to lower electric kiln costs. And this is a fabulous blog. Um, Reduce our water in the studio. Uh, and at Otis, I have removed the sink uh, and use of the sink. Students are now down to um, half a tofu container of water per class. The water will be recycled to be used to make slip and to reconstitute clay. Um, I haven't figured out how to store electricity yet. Uh, however, I, I'm open, please help me. Uh, I'm thinking that uh, functional pottery uh, will replace paper and plastic. So I'm in negotiations with the food service at Otis. Um, ceramic programs must be the, uh, we must lead the charge to innovate. We need to reuse our public spaces and malls. I have a former student who is an avionic engineer at SpaceX and now opened his own startup and uh, converting parking structures in San Francisco, empty parking structures in San Francisco to grow agriculture. He was the lighting expert for um, many, for all of SpaceX, um, uh, air, uh, I guess, spacecraft. Um, science will save us from COVID. COVID will, uh, science will also save us from climate change. It's our job as artists and designers to translate the science so that it's readily understandable by the public. I think that there's all kinds of opportunity for retraining everyone. Jobs in new environmentally sound infrastructure is opening up as we speak and innovation will create future jobs. Um, my textbook for my science class that I'm teaching at Otis, I have returned back to science after almost 40 years, and nobody knew at Otis knew of my science background, and so now I'm, I have been renamed the unnatural science teacher, and our, um, our textbook will be Bill Gates, How to Avoid Climate Disaster, uh, and students will be conducting experiments on campus. And so thank you very much. I'm working on a series called California Wild Wildfires for obvious reasons. Thank you so much. All of you are my heroes and sheroes in this field. And, and thank you for all of you from all over the world for attending. Thank you, Joan, for packing in so much incredible information, finite um, ideas. And, and those are the kinds of examples of tips that are included in the eco guide. So we're looking forward to sharing all of that with you. Thank you, Joan. Um, You're welcome. And, and also for raising the issue of the total systemic change that obviously is the other factor, the balance between the finite and uh, the studio focused and, and practice focused along with the total environmental change that we're all a part of as well. Um, Next, our final presen presentation will be from Brian Mansell, who is the president and owner of Laguna Clay. Hi, Brian. Thank Hi, you Emily. so much for joining us today. Um, we are looking forward to your very different perspective, which obviously is um, at the core of everything we're looking at. So thank you. Well, uh, uh, just congratulations to all the previous panelists. Goodness gracious. It's amazing to see what's happening in our community um, and inspiring. My background, real briefly, I have a Master of Fine Arts from Claremont Graduate School, and I was teaching at San Francisco State, non-tenured, unfortunately, and the 92 recession came, and my wife was pregnant with our third child, and I didn't have a job. So it was a little daunting. So I got involved with an industry. It's a long story on how that happened. But the industries that I've been involved in was uh, Mission Rubber, which is a cradle to cradle certified company, and Mission Clay Products, which we brought sustainability through SMART certification. When SMART did their testing of our products, they came back and said, we've never seen a more an amazing, simple ingredient to your materials besides clay, water, and fire. And they gave us a gold certification. 
So both companies have worked very, very hard on this particular process of sustainability, environmental concerns. In, 19, in 2017, uh, we bought Laguna Clay Company. And whenever you buy a company, you inherit whatever is there. And of course, I looked at ceramics as an opportunity with a Master of Fine Arts degree and a love of clay and certainly a love of the community. If, as you all know, I don't think there's a better person on, out there than ceramic individuals. They're just amazing people. And they start from taking a class in ceramics where they trust some wonderful gremlin to come at nighttime and take this very special piece and they put it into a kiln for them. Then they bring the piece back and it's bisque fired. Then they trust these buckets of glaze that look nothing like the finished product. And they're trusting people to then take that product, put it into a kiln and they come back with these very precious items. And so I think the whole ceramic community has really has that amazing quality of sharing, caring, giving, and working together as a group. So I've been very fortunate to be a part of that. My presentation today is some of the things that we are attempting on industry. And it's a challenge because you have hit, a lot of you have hit on some of the issues that are some of our biggest challenges also. We're working to address them. And I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, I have notes. So if that's okay, I'm gonna go through these notes and share with you all the things we've been doing at Laguna Clay in the last four years since I've been here. And then perhaps in the Q&A afterwards, we can, uh, we can address them a little bit more closely. But some of the thing, one of the things that we've started to do here is we actually do a dust recycle. And as you can imagine, when you're using ceramic materials and we're pugging clay and we're making glazes and we're batching all these things, that there's a dust involved with all this. Of course, we all have respirators and all the uh, Q&A that we need to do here. Uh, AMQ, uh, Southern California Air Quality Management District comes and visits us on a continuous basis. But we have these big dust collectors and we take all this dust and we have a clay lab and a glaze lab. And we actually run tests on all this and we run on experimental glazes and clays and we incorporate that into our products. So we really do retain a great amount of all the partic particular matter, if you will, for our clays and glazes that we recycle right back into them. We have installed since I've been here motion sensor lights. So when you have a facility as large as this, the energy is quite amazing. We've looked into solar. It's a challenge with solar on a building this large with big equipment to have the storage that you need to run this equipment. But we're looking at proposals for doing that. But in the meantime, we put in a lot of motion sensor lights. And when you walk into rooms, things come above uh, or light up. And as you leave, of course, they, they leave. We have a new policy that's been in effect for two years on no pallet returns. Now, if you can imagine the amount of pallets that we use in industry, every single truck that comes in that we buy materials from has 22 pallets times uh, a lot of trucks. And we, the pallets then were reused and we put them in our, in our orders to all of our distributors and we send them back to them. And the policy was those could all be recycled and sent back, to, not recycled, but they could be sent back to us for credit. So I decided to take the pallet charge, which was $15 a pallet. We dropped it to five. So we take a loss in the pallets. However, what I've told all our big distributors, please keep them in your backyard. There is certainly a pallet manufacturer or a pallet company around there. There's always these individuals that are taking old and used pallets, uh, refurbishing them, putting some extra nails and staples in there, replacing a few boards. And so we made the cost super cheap for the pallet that we send out to our distributors and then ask them to find some recycling. So we don't have these trucks called coming all the way back from Arizona, uh, literally from Arizona, from Oregon, from states that have an immense amount of obviously trucking involved with all that stuff. Uh, we're actually looking into some electrical forklifts here and I'll explain that a little bit later with some of the new things we're working on. Uh, we're using local clays is, is to some extent. Now, I don't know, uh, I do know. Ceramic artists are very particular and very specific about their clay. They really, really are. And you as a group are probably uh, some of the exception that you're taking materials that are locally sourced and digging up and using for your products as best as you can, but it's a challenge. We've got a lot of customers all over the country. And so I actually am fortunate enough to have some sources of clay locally. So we're actually mining some clay down in Southern California in Corona. And we got five clay sources that I bring in here to Laguna. And through our clay labs, we've come up with some new local clays. We're really hoping that the local clays, which are a 30 mile carbon footprint, if you will, 
that the local clays will be something of interest to the schools specifically. They're not going to be your best, wonderful, most plastic, most durable, most sculptural clays. But I think for the younger audiences, for beginning classes, and maybe even some intermediate classes, all the big state schools in California are the biggest ceramic programs. Cal State Fullerton, Cal State Long Beach, Cal State LA, um, Cal State San Francisco, Cal State San Jose State, they're all really, really large ceramic departments that were established probably back in the 50s and 60s and all cone 10 high fire kilns. So we're working on a bunch of local clays that are cone five. And the cone five will go with what we think is a really beautiful glaze that Laguna has here. And so we're pushing the, the cone five electric kilns. We brought in l and we brought in Scott, we brought in Cress. We're gonna have them make presentations on their kilns. We're having a grand opening here on August 28th. You're all invited if you're in the neighborhood. And we will be presenting products, of course, but the mid-range fire is something that has really grown incredibly strong. Back in the day, even when I was in school, Cone 10 was, was the way. And Cone 5 is something that we're really pushing very, very hard here and working with some of the kiln manufacturers for literature and data. Scott does a very good job in showing how much it costs to fire a kiln, one of their kilns, as versus perhaps some other kiln. So we've been working on that quite a bit. Uh, we've gone paperless to the best that we can. Now, if you had a bigger screen, you would see paper on my desk and I have to apologize for that a little bit. I'm a visual person, so I don't stack so well like a computer does where you have information that's all stacked. I kind of lay things out, I have to see it. But we actually invested in a new ERP system last year and it has been quite the challenge. Uh, bringing a new sophisticated ERP system to a clay manufacturer of clay and glazes has been quite the challenge. But what it's done is it allow us to eliminate reams and reams and reams of paper and reams and reams of ink by allowing our users, sales offices, the shipping and the freight department to work on a very much more minimal basis in regards to the use of paper products that we have here. To augment that, I bought two shredders. So we have a shredder in building A and we have a shredder on building B. And every paper we do have, we shred that, we put it into big bags, we take it downstairs and all of our small packing. So if you order something from Laguna Clay, we're hoping, it's not always, that you will have shredded paper inside that package versus peanuts and other things. And we're really working to eliminate all the packing material, bubble wraps and things. Now, you know, those things are pretty great with ceramics, as you all know but we're doing our best to try to utilize not only a paperless ERP system, but shredders that do facilitate shredding all the paper that we have to use that for packaging. Uh, we've got some new printers here, our color printers, and it's an Epson water-based non-toxic ink, and we use it, it, we replace it once a year. It's pretty extraordinary. Now it doesn't give you quite the brilliant colors, but for most of the things we do, it's just fine. And it's just a small step, but we're hoping it's one of those little steps we all need to be taking. Uh, we're working on a new online catalog. So it'll be out very, very, very soon. And as versus printing gazillions of catalogs and distributing them to everyone, uh, we'll certainly distribute some and print some. We'll probably send one to each distributor. We'll send one to those that perhaps don't want to do with technology and they're not really good with their computers and they would like that hard copy. You know, I can't blame them. I still buy a newspaper, believe it or not. But we're working on online catalogs. All of our literature is online and our website has been revamped. So you can go to and find more and more literature. We continue to add to that as best we can. And, uh, you know, any suggestions and observations that we have from the artistic community, we're more than happy to listen to. Um, we do refurbish a lot of equipment here. So if you've got a wheel that needs a tune-up, bring it over to us. Instead of buying a new wheel, uh, we have Roberto, who's awesome. And we have uh, some people down there, Kevin, and they're really, really good guys, as is everybody here. I'm bragging a little bit. And they'll work on your wheels. They'll work on your electric kilns, if needed. We build gas kilns. Those are a little bit harder to transport back and forth, but we do have people that can come out and visit you. Um, one of the biggest things that we are working on, and it's still in the design phase, is a complete facility redo. So Harvey Mudd is a school over in the Claremont Colleges, and these kids are brilliant. 
that's just so much fun to work with these young kids. They're young adults. And this is a mechanical engineering school. And I'm familiar with a professor over there. So this is the second summer that I brought students in. He picks them. I give them an assignment that he picks them. And this year's assignment was to redesign our whole facility. And how would we lay it out better? How would we make it more uh, ergonomic? How, how could we eliminate certain equipment, AKA forklifts and things like that? So they just finished last Friday and they made a really wonderful presentation to me. We're gonna get it hard bound so I have it to look at. And then of course we got all the files, but the facility basically will be, uh, we're gonna reduce the facility by 37% in size and hopefully increase production by 20%. Now to do that, you have to be really smart with your layout. So they've literally taken recipes of our clays, our most popular clays. They've laid out this whole um, format, if you will, aisles in the facility. And we will have what they call pickers. And pickers are the things that you see in Home Depot. So the aisles can be narrowed and the picker goes through, lifts up, can pick something up, shift around, pick something up. And basically the batcher will go through these aisles of these clay recipes of our most popular clay recipes and batch these materials. Right now, what we do is we have a warehouse where you batch all of you pick up all the material by pallets, you bring it out and you palletize certain clays and you go back in and you get another pallet. Then you come back and you go back and forth many, many, many times to get to that point. Doing this new layout that reduces our footprint and increases our capacity, we reduce our forklift use by 65%. So those kinds of numbers are really, really important to us you know, one on the sustainability, but you know, in all honesty, too, there's a there's a you know there's a function with business that there has to be some profitability involved with all this. So so it is a really a, a win win. We're hoping it's going to take a while to implement, and it's not a cheap process, but we think it's worth pursuing moving forward. Um, we have charging stations for car here, so if you have an electric car and you want to come visit, now I don't have a Tesla, I have a Chevy Bolt, so um, but if you want to come visit you can charge your car here with us and we're going to put in some more charging stations and i'm trying to influence uh, what's not the word influence i'm trying to entice some of the people that are looking at new cars some of the we have an accountant here that needs a new car she drives a truck and she wants to get an electric car we have an hr person here that drives a big minivan and she wants an electric car so we're hoping the residual of seeing electric car parked in front of laguna clay every day and the opportunity of putting in more charging stations will help to influence that uh, as we move forward and grow as a company. Um, I have solar panels on my house, so I don't know if that counts, but I thought we do. And um, uh, basically at Laguna Clay, manufacturing is the challenge. It really is in the context of a lot of the things that you have brought up as a group. When you talk about transportation of materials, it's really hard uh, to, to source locally all the things that a ceramic manufacturer needs to satisfy the needs of all their, uh, all their clients. But we are looking at them on a daily basis. Freight costs are out the roof. You've probably all heard about the supply chain issue going on in the country right now. And it's affecting us greatly. We've got delays on a lot of things, which is making us go and source other sources, other areas, other materials. And um, so it's, it's kind of a one step at a time, but we're working in the right direction. We're really excited about what's happening here at Laguna. We got a, I got a great group of people. I mean, you know, it's always about the people, right? And they're, they're just fantastic. So if you're in the area, I know City of Industry is not one of those places you just stop in and say hi. It's not. But if you drive in the, in the vicinity, we'd love to have you. We'd love to show you around. Our, our opening is August 28th. We're gonna be doing tours of the facility and we'll have a lot of fun things that are here. And Emily, thank you for inviting me to this. This is, uh, you got a, an amazing panel. Thank you, Brian. Perfect, perfect um, closing to the presentations, I think, with everything you've raised. Um, I'm sure this opens up a lot of questions for everybody. Thank you so much uh, for what you are doing there. It's phenomenal and a model that hopefully you know, others can learn from. Um, everyone is, uh, all the panelists are joining us again. So we're gonna open up for a conversation amongst all of you uh, and also address questions that have come in 
from the audience. There's just a few right now. Feel free to type more into our Q and A at this point. Um, I wonder if somebody would like to begin. Uh, I see Julia, your hand is up. You are muted though. It's hard to mute me, I know. But um, wow, those are so great. I so enjoyed that. Brian, I would love to know, um, like I could choose a lot of different kinds of ball clay, right? For my general clay body, I just use a little ball clay. And I would love to know which ball clays, and this is just hypothetical or whatever, you could answer this generally, but I would like to know what clays have the least sort of traveling footprint. Like I was sort of startled that mince bar is processed uh, across the ocean. So I think that kind of like, like, that's like a little decision I could make that, that might make a big difference. Do you have information like that? Well, we're looking into it, Julia. And that's a great question. If you send me an email, I'd be happy to go through the materials that you use. And we're looking at the, the sourcing that we can ap uh, apply to that question. Again, back to one of the things that I mentioned, you know, ceramic artists are really specific. I mean, they very have, they're dialed in, right? This is my clay. These are the ingredients. This is the plasticity. This is the strength. This is the shrinkage. This is the porosity. And so, you know, trying to find that balance is always the challenge because we love the output of what these artists do, you included. And so, but if you send me an email and said, Brian, these are some of the clays that I am using. Can you share with me a local source that may be closer than maybe I'm purchasing from now? You know, we send a bunch of stuff up to Archie Bray. So we're, we're helping a little bit. <laughs> yep, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. A couple more questions, Brian. Um, do you sell used equipment for one? We don't sell used equipment, but we do have a board in our retail center and people that contact us, we list that stuff on there. If we were requested to post that and instead of just having it where you have to visit us and see it, you would actually could go to our website maybe and we'd have a, a link that you could hook on it and we could do that. That's actually a pretty good suggestion. That would be great. Yeah, and I'm yeah. sure all of us would love to share that and extend who can who can view that. Um, let's see. Question about uh, preventing glaze waste. Glaze waste, and um, that is something I would say Julia covers in her field guide, I believe, which is filled with incredible information as well. This is something that many of you addressed in terms of your input into the eco guide. So there's bits um, of information. And I will say just in terms of cross fields, um, cross media, it's really impressive to see how many ceramic artists are, are really thinking this through as a media um, and have a number of solutions for, for that. So again, it's one of the themes that I think is coming through from what all of you have said is that this is about corralling all the information and um, all the innovation that is happening among individual artists and finding a way to share that information to the bigger audience um, and the bigger community of artists. Um, question about um, guidelines for clean green ceramics. Um, and how you approach building studios. Um, I will also say again, this is something that we've started bits and pieces of in terms of the eco guide. Um, but Wendy, would you like to respond to you know the actual design of studios um, and how that weighs into the certification process? Okay. Um, firstly, I'm not an artist. I, you know, I'm an art historian curator. So the actual physical um, logistics of and ergonomics of um, of studio design to involve the least touches, um, and uh, which is usually the the main um, criteria as I'm sure Brian could elaborate on in terms of uh, redesigning um, facilities. Yeah, I think that's sort of the main consideration. Um, you know, certainly uh, I, I'm not, not an expert in that. Perhaps Julia also could, could comment on that and Brian, and let's open up this question. And I would also say one aspect that's come through in our work um, over these past months is the idea of passive um, air ventilation, heat as much as possible, skylighting, uh, you know, there's so many finite 
um, ideas now of, that can be that can be adapted to whatever your space may be, even if you're not the owner of your space for that matter. Um, but any anyone else who wants to add some of the um, the physical aspects, uh, the design aspects of a studio space that jump out as the key starting points. I think certainly in terms of water, obviously one of them is a clay trap and and setting up a proper place for recycling and managing uh, waste clay and glaze within the process. What what we've seen at um, at studios and community studios where that have implemented recycling programs is that it sort of gets fobbed off onto one person and, and that one person gets stuck with the dirty work. Other studios pay or universities pay students to, to take care of the recycling. My, my feeling around that is it's everybody's responsibility and you know every student and every member of a community studio should at some point do a recycle shift. Um, and that it that it is it's our, our shared problem and shouldn't be delegated and relegated to the most junior staff member or um, the most the, sort of the newest person on the young kid on the block. So there's so many aspects of of this, and um, I'm sure that that yeah, Julia and other people can also bring up other aspects of or key aspects of studio design, solar yeah. powered, solar power is really important where, where one can do that and where that's viable. It's not viable internationally, In, you know, all over the world. It's not viable financially all over the world at this point. Important, important to consider, definitely. Joan, yeah, would you like to respond to some of that of, just in terms of what you do in your own studio as well as at Otis? No water, no water, period. No water. Yeah. And um, you mentioned limiting access I, to a sink. Yeah, yeah. I covered the sink in uh, Otis with a board uh, in the ceramic studio to encourage. Uh, we live in a drought problem in Southern California. It is, and uh, Pasadena has adopted no watering of our yard. Only uh, I can only water on Thursday and Mondays. Um, so now I'm just trying to preserve my trees uh, at this point. So I think we know that there's a serious problem. So that's why I recycle the tofu containers because all Japanese American people recycle their tofu containers. I have plenty, I have a life uh, a stash, but the, I'm using that as a way of measuring half a tofu container of water for per student period for the whole, for, the, for 15 weeks. Now I can't enforce that, but it is making, it's sending a message. Joan, you're tough. I am. That's tough. And we are trans we're translating our findings in all languages. So um, research is being done in all languages as Otis is the most diverse co art college in the country. And so when we publish something, we're writing it in English. That's mandatory that everyone learn English, but also in native languages as well, because this is a global issue. Very much so. Thanks, Joan. I think I don't know that much about designing studios, but I do think that uh, when I moved from New York to Montana, I had to shift all my practices and also different methods of firing became more effective depending on where I lived. So, um, you know, it, it's a long way for electricity to travel across Montana, you know? So it's just a different, I think a lot of these questions, we hope there's this one perfect answer but I think so it's more complicated than that, which is I think why sometimes people feel burdened by environmental practices, because what works best in Montana really will not be what works best in Los Angeles or will not be best that, you know, what works in New York City. So I think that um, it's one of these reasons why I think we have a hard time when we're sort of grappling with this is that there's really not a clear answer. And uh, it, we need to figure out, I would love to figure out how research could be um, like a little easier for us to, to get to, do you know? You, you know, I, I do, I just wanna interject again quickly. Um, I have a saying, money talks and bullshit walks and making profit with, what, with your practice is, is, is environmentally sound most in many, many ways. So in other words, you know, if you can cut here, this cost, whether it's an electric bill or it is your clay costs 
or it's your production costs or your shipping costs, anything you can do, um, eventually climate change will be profitable. And when we see profitable practices, we will reverse this problem. I am very convinced that at the colleges must innovate. We must work in partnership with companies like Laguna, you know, and, and we work together and grant money in the future, I think is heading in that direction. So, you know, let's, um, let's champion this and let's see what happens. Again, lots of failure on the way, I'm sure, but we will, we will make it, we will make it. We have to. Stephen, were you look like you were going to add something to that? Um, in terms of what you saw, I'd say you know when you wrote the ceramic elephant in the room, and just in this ten-year period, let alone the fifty years you mentioned, it seems like um, what we're getting at is that this is the beginning of the conversation. Um, fifty years later, or however you want to define it, but that this change needs to happen really fast. Um, wonder if you'd like to add your philosophy and ideas to any of that part of the conversation. Not, yeah, I'm not sure what more I can add. I, you know, it, it's the urgency to, to make changes. Is, I mean, it, it, things couldn't be more urgent, but uh, as the other panelists have alluded to, it's gonna take time, uh, you know, for us to convert. I mean, I, mean, I the only clean green solution to firing is electric firing using properly sourced electricity. That's gonna take a long time to accomplish that. So, uh, you know, but, you know, fortunately we have uh, the right people in, <clears throat> in the nation's capital and they are making, making efforts to make those changes. Uh, so um, we'll keep our fingers crossed, but I think, you know, it's going to take some, we, we humans move slowly, even though it's, um, you know, we need, we need to move quickly. Um, question, Brian, what you see from the economic side of the increase in demand um, on the, when that began, has that, has that actually increased, um, you know, over the last five years or so, or, you know, are you seeing that change happening? Because I know you respond to the demand of your clients and customers and, and it's gotta come from there. Um, yes and no. I think, you know, going back to inheriting something, it takes a while to change a culture and to work on those sorts of things. And as everybody has reiterated, it's small bites, one bite at a time, you know, to, uh, to sort of reflect on Steve, you know, so how do you eat an elephant? Right, one bite at a time. And so I, I think that those are the things with these types of seminars and getting to meet some of you. I mean, it's really wonderful to meet. I know Joan, she's awesome. She was on the board with me at Amoka and man, what a voice you want to have on your board. She's outstanding. And uh, so I, I think all these things, Emily, will lead to slow changes. We do have people come in and make suggestions and have ideas and we listen and we try to implement it again, you know, slowly as best we can. And um, you know, the challenges right now from COVID has put a, a, a little bit of, um, I don't know if handcuffs is the right word, but this whole supply side thing with materials and freight and transport has become so challenging because of the lack of availability out there. You know, uh, containers are incredibly expensive. Everything is really, really, really expensive right now. So we look at all these alternatives and all these options. And Julie, I love your question. You know, where's the closest uh, place to, to source ball clay? I love that. And I think that's a great project for us to dig into deeper to see where we can find things. So, you know, one of the challenges, again, it's the ceramic industry and we have to be creative and look in, you know, we got a couple of labs here. We had a clay lab, we have a glaze lab. So we have to be looking at all this stuff. And the big scuttlebutt right now is zirconium. Now, Zircopax is something that people use a lot on their glazes. It's a, it's a wonderful material. And the mines in South Africa are having a lot of problems and a lot of issues, right? And so uh, somebody will call me and say, Brian, you know, what are you doing about the zirconium issue? I'm like, ooh, okay, well, let me look into this. This is a real challenge. And, uh, but it certainly brings things to light. And it makes us now, instead of just maybe not even knowing where some of these things are sourced, to really dig in and find out where they're sourced so we can look for those kinds of alternatives. So... Uh, I, I'm hoping that answered you a little bit. 
things. Um, we have a slew of questions coming in. I know we're at about 1230. Obviously this conversation uh, is much bigger and should go extend for much, much more time. Um, Richard Nankin raised the issue. I mean, we're talking um, in the comments, I see several uh, about um, firing less and kind of editing what's fired is, is one big issue. I don't know if you all wanna address. And then the other issue uh, that Richard Nankin has raised is smaller scale work, which I know Stephen mentioned a little bit at the beginning. Two big topics really about shifting practices um, more than shifting your spaces and um, you know what happens in terms of the design of spaces, much bigger questions. Anyone wanna? I agree wholeheartedly with what Richard Nankin said. I mean, he's right. I mean, that's one, one way we can move forward is working smaller editing, not firing everything. You and I talked about this just prior to this. Uh, so yeah, I think th those are good solutions and you know, difficult to do with students because they want to keep everything. But uh, you know, I, I think it's a good, good idea. Um, yeah, I mean, I think those topics in of themselves could probably merit their own um, discussion set, uh, sessions hour long plus just yeah. to really how to tackle strategically that shift in how people work. So thank you for that. Um, I We are at 1230. This has been a phenomenal uh, beginning to this discussion or advancing of this conversation. I want to thank all of you so much, uh, the five of you, for participating in this and providing your incredibly informed perspectives. Everything that each of you uh, is already doing is exemplary, and this is the idea that everyone can learn from each other and innovate through these issues, very much as Bill Gates says as well in his book. It's truly about innovation, and obviously artists are at the core we're making that happen always across the board in every way, shape, and form. So thank you, thank you all for being here and for everyone who attended today.